even Isaac Newton probably thought about space travel. There's a wonderful picture in his book Principia showing cannonballs being fired from a mountain top and they fall down to earth. But if the cannonball is fired fast enough, then its trajectory curves downwards no more steeply than the earth curves away underneath it. It goes into orbit. And he calculated that in order to go into that kind of orbit, it would have to be fired at 18,000 miles an hour. That's 25,000 kilometers per hour. Far beyond, of course, what could be achieved by Cannon in his time. And, of course, it wasn't until 1957 that the Soviet Sputnik was the first orbiting object to be actually sent artificially into space. And that was followed uh, by uh, some dogs and then by Yuri Gagarin and then by the uh, uh, space uh, race between the United States and the Soviet Union uh, and the Apollo program, which landed men on the moon in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Since that time, manned spaceflight has rather languished. It's more than 40 years since people landed on the moon. You've got to be middle-aged to remember when that happened. To young people today, it's ancient history that people walked on the Mars. They know that the Americans landed men on the moon. They know the Egyptians built pyramids. But these, in both cases, seem rather ancient history motivated by rather arcane goals. And of course, what drove the space race at that time was superpower rivalry between the Soviet Union and the United States. Had that momentum been maintained, had the huge expenditure been maintained, there'd be footprints on Mars by now. But of course, since that time, no humans have been further than low Earth orbit, in many cases, in the space station. The reason for that is partly that the case for sending people into space is getting weaker all the time as miniaturization gets more advanced and as robotics get better. And of course it's far cheaper to send robots, you don't need to bring them back, and that is the way in which we have learned a great deal about our solar system. Of course we depend on space every day uh, for sat-nav communications um, and environmental monitoring and uh, telecommunications. Uh, and also, uh, we depend in astronomy on telescopes up in space above the blurring and absorption effect of the Earth's atmosphere. So we've learnt a great deal about um, our universe from being able to go into space. And, of course, robotic space probes have gone to all the planets and major bodies of our solar system. Many have gone to Mars. There's the Curiosity rover, which is an American uh, probe about the size of a small car, which has been trundling across the surface of Mars for about four years, studying its geology. And probes have been to uh, uh, Saturn and Jupiter. And famously, uh, in the last two years, um, uh, an American probe has sent back pictures of Pluto, 10,000 times further away than the moon, and a European probe has landed on a comet, the Rosetta probe. And this indicates the advance in robotics. And we can do much better now because the frustration for the people involved in the Pluto and comet probes is that the technology they were using was 15 years out of date. It took 10 years to get to Pluto, 10 years to get to the comet, and of course you have to settle a design of a spacecraft five years before launch. So if we think how smartphones have developed in the last 15 years, we realize how much better robotic probes could be now. And so I fully expect that in the next decades, we'll have hugely advanced robotic probes exploring all the bodies of our solar system in far more detail than today. Another thing that will happen is that we'll have very large robots fabricating things in space. The limit now is that there's a limit to the size of an object that you could put in the nose cone of a rocket to send it to space. But if you can fabricate things up there, maybe mining material from the moon or from an asteroid, you could build huge lightweight structures, huge telescopes, huge solar energy collectors in space. And I think that will happen. But what about people going into space? As I said, the case for people is getting weaker as robots get more advanced and we'll certainly have 
in 10 or 20 years, uh, robots able to build structures in space without humans being there at all. But I think nonetheless that humans will still want to go into space as an adventure. And the first people on Mars, I think, will be going as an adventure rather than for practical purposes. Because it could be that the Chinese decide to have a big, spectacular program to send people to Mars. And they'd have to go to Mars because if China wants to assert its superpower parity with the United States, it wouldn't be very sensible to do something the United States did 50 years earlier. They'd have to do something new. They'd have to go to Mars. But if they don't decide, then I think the future of manned spaceflight lies with private companies. And there are some of these in the United States already because they can accept higher risks than NASA or ESA can impose on civilians publicly funded. And so my scenario is that companies like those already existing in the space, in, in the United States, um, SpaceX run by Elon Musk and Blue Origin run by Jeff Bezos, these are two billionaires in the US, I think they will be launching people into space. They are already planning to launch people into low Earth orbit. And then there's a plan to launch people on uh, an orbit going around the backside of the moon, but not landing, and coming back. That takes about five days. I'm told they've sold the ticket for the second flight, but not the first flight. That perhaps tells you something about the risks involved. But maybe in 20 or 30 years, people will go on Mar to Mars, maybe even with one-way tickets, and there'll be volunteers. And Elon Musk himself, who is the pioneer of spaceflight, he says he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. And 40 years from now, he might be able to do that. He's only 44 years old now, so he might be able to end his days on Mars. And so I think there will be, by the end of the century certainly, a community of people living away from the Earth, probably on Mars. But they will be sort of pioneers. They'll be the same kind of crazy people um, who um, uh, uh, drag sledges across the Antarctic or fall from a supersonic balloon or the Russian uh, who went round the world in a, uh, in a, a high altitude balloon and does many other things. There'd be people like that who are prepared to take high risks, adventurers and uh, uh, libertarians who want to get away from the Earth. They'd be the kind of people who'll be living on Mars. And I think this will have an important consequences for the future of humanity. Because we know that what's happening now is that technology is advancing uh, in that we can do genetic modification on humans and we can have cyborg technology where we link ourselves to machines and maybe download to machines. And I think there'll be some ethical constraints on using these techniques here on Earth. But if we imagine these people away from the Earth they'll be away from any legal restrictions on the Earth. And moreover, they will have a very strong incentive to adapt themselves or their progeny to this very alien environment to which humans are ill-adapted. So they will use these technologies to modify their descendants and perhaps use uh, uh, cyborg techniques. And they will be the first post-humans. They will change into a new species within a few centuries. And then, the future of evolution will depend on descendants of those pioneers. And let's bear in mind that uh, that evolution, technological evolution, will be far faster than Darwinian selection that's led to us. Darwinian selection is such that it takes millions of years for a new species to evolve and then become extinct. But on the technological timescale, we can imagine in future that these uh, aliens uh, will develop from human beings because they will have a huge incentive if they're in space to modify themselves and adapt to this alien environment. So I see that there will be people living on Mars by the end of a century and they will um, be the first people who will use these techniques to adapt themselves so drastically to this very different environment that eventually they will lead to post-humans within just a few centuries. One of the problems with, of course, uh, space exploration is we depend on chemical fuel. And this is intrinsically rather inefficient and limits the speed which a rocket can achieve. And if we really wanted uh, to extend 
our range beyond our solar system, then we've got to develop some kind of uh, fuel more efficient than chemical fuel so that we can get up to higher speeds because it would take tens of thousands of years to get to the nearest star using chemical fuel. You need to develop some kind of nuclear engine or even something far better than that in order to get further. So until we can get a new kind of fuel for our rockets, then certainly manned spaceflight is going to be restricted to the inner part of our solar system. Um, but if we can have uh, new kinds of fuel, uh, then it may be possible for humans to go to the stars. The other possibility, of course, is that we will have post-humans who will have a far longer lifetime than human beings have. And, of course, if your life is measured in thousands of years, then a very long journey is less daunting than it is if we have human lifetimes limited to less than 100 years. So I think the future of exploration by humans beyond our solar system will have to await either the evolution of creatures with a far longer lifespan or the development of some kind of uh, uh, space technology which allows rockets to go at a good fraction of the speed of light, which will be a huge advance on chemical rockets which can only barely escape from the Earth's atmosphere.